Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to talk here. Um, I will talk a little bit of our work that we are doing in Grenoble, the University of Grenoble. I'm employed by the CNRS. And uh, this work is um, partly financed by the uh, European Research Council. And uh, I will cover different, different aspects that, are, that is done in the group. And this is the group. Uh, so there's this work done together with Alexandre Nicolas, who just finished his thesis, Elisabeth Agoritzes, who's working on uh, mean field models, Jean-Louis Barra, who's the head of the ERC project, uh, Eric Bertin, who's also working on the mean field descriptions, Frances Frances <laughs> Sorry. Francesco Puisi, who's doing uh, microscopic simulations, and then also Ezekiel Ferrero, who's doing mesoscopic models. And uh, Ezekiel, Elisabeth, and Jean-Louis are here as well. So you can discuss with them as well. So now. Um, in earlier talks, people were discussing about whether um, details matter or not. And uh, I'm a physicist, and I have a physicist point of view. And for me, I would like to say that uh, metallic glasses, polymer glasses, gels, and foams are all the same. Of course, they are not. <laughs> um, so uh, in appearance, they are very different. So, but I want to concentrate on their common features. So what are the common features of these materials? Um, they are disordered on the, on the level of particles. And um, when you shear them, they behave solid-like uh, um, underneath the force, a given force, critical force. And above a critical force, they start to flow. So there's this yielding transition. And um, all of these materials have something in common when you, when you force them, is that their response is very heterogeneous. So you will have some local rearrangements that occur. So this idea of localized shear transformation is, very, is already a, bit, a little bit old. Um, it uh, was proposed by Ali Agon. And the similarity between glasses and foams, um, the analogy um, to think about the systems is also very old. It was first proposed by Bragg in the crystalline uh, material systems, where he compared this with monodispersed bubble rafts. So, <coughs> I want to uh, set the vocabulary as well. So I will talk about different scales. Always when I talk about microscale, I mean on the particle level. This can be atoms, this can be bubbles, this can be different sizes, right? So when I talk about the macroscale, I talk about observables that are averaged over the whole system size. And then I will also talk about the mesoscale. And the mesoscale for me will be um, some tenths of particles. And uh, it will be the size of a typical rearrangement. So now I'm coming to the response to the steady shear. So here we see some microscopic realizations of this localized events. So this is a, a work uh, done by uh, this one particularly is done by Anton Guiadal. But there are similar works by Maloney and Lemaitre that show that um, these, uh, this response is very much localized. Um, and this is an experiment, it doesn't look like, but it, this is an, a colloidal experiment by Peter Schall, who sees also this experimental verification of this localized events. And on the macroscopic scale, what people look at, for example, is the stress versus strain curve. And you see that you have something that looks pretty much like elastic response, and then you have yielding. And you can see this in hard materials, but also in gels, for example. So when talking about um, soft materials, oh, sorry. First of all, uh, one of the, so I think pretty much everybody, maybe 97% is agreeing on this picture of this localized events in this room. And um, so uh, one of the important questions is, how can we uh, connect what is happening on the micro scale with what we see on the macro scale. So many people are working on this. And uh, I put the bridge here, and it's a long bridge because it's very difficult. So it's maybe even not possible to write down 
the equation and do a proper uh, coarse graining to derive macroscopic equation from the microscopic dynamics. It's a very difficult problem. So when talking about real uh, soft material, there is another curve which is often displayed, um, which is the rheological curve. curve. And uh, this is concerned with the steady state of the system. So you shear it until it reaches steady state. So, and there are two scenarios possible. So you have here the flow transition. If your shear rate equals zero, it doesn't flow. If you increase the shear rate, it starts to flow. And the first scenario is that you have a continuous transition to flow. And uh, this is associated with uh, phenomenological law, which is the herschel barclay law, which is given here with a finite yield stress and some power law behavior in the shear rate. But there's also a second scenario possible, which is a discontinuous transition, where you see that if, when you increase uh, the shear rate, um, the, the medium in the steady state is not responding homogeneously, but there are shear bands forming up to a critical value of the shear rate. And uh, this is explained, for example, here by Cousseau et al. And what you see um, is instead of having a herschel barclay law, you will have a plateau here, and you will start above a critical shear rate to have a power law. Okay, so the question, many people here already asked the question, what are the dynamics close to the transition? So in this continuous transition <coughs> scenario. But I also want to ask another question, that is, what is the control parameter that takes me from a system which is displaying homogeneous flow <coughs> to a system which is showing shear bands. Okay. Um, so uh, these are experiments. This is another motivation to look at this question, um, where you see that uh, within the same systems, when you change, uh, for example, um, emulsions and you make them attractive for depletion, you will have in the non-adhesive case, typical herschel barclay curve, where, whereas in the adhesive case, you will have this plateau. This is difficult to distinguish, I agree. Um, so what you really need to do to distinguish this type of um, dynamics is to look at spatial uh, flow. And you see that, for example, in this uh, emulsion experiment, they have here <coughs> the shear band that appear. Okay, so far to the introduction. Now I will come to the model that I want to study. And uh, this model is uh, very much um, inspired by what uh, Damien was showing the other day. Um, they were the first to uh, propose such a type of model within this context. And um, the aim is to have a very, very simplistic lattice model with minimal ingredients might not be realistic, but it gives a tool at hand to test several um, physical concepts. So the minimal ingredients are plastic events and elastic stress redistribution. We will consider thermal systems. So now I'm already restraining myself rather to uh, more microscopic systems like foams or emulsions or colloids. Then uh, I consider here periodic boundary conditions Simple shear, because um, then you can just look at the scalar sh stress, it's easier. And uh, over damp dynamics, so I, I will not include inertia. And um, this first works uh, by Vandenbroek and Ruhe was, were done in the quasi-static limits. Um, so this is an extremal model. Uh, I want to study the rheology, so this means I need also to introduce uh, time dependence of the equation. And uh, I just wanted to point out that there are many people now more and more working on this uh, type of models. And um, it can give uh, uh, a good insight what is happening on a more cross-grain scale. Next. So what we will um, put into the model to describe the elastic interaction uh, this was shown already by Itama Popocaccia earlier. For, so for the simple shear case, uh, you can have a propagator that has this form for the stress. And uh, it's depicted here. So it has this uh, typical quadrupolar form that we saw already several times. And uh, this is uh, simulations. 
And when you look at the average displacement field, uh, non-affinite uh, displacement field, and Leonard-Jones simulations, you can really reproduce this. This is a very beautiful work, which is very recent. And uh, so the model that we want to build up is uh, composed of uh, first elastic parts. So when I start to shear, the system will just uh, increase elastically its, its stress up to the appearance of the first uh, uh, yield events. And uh, these yield events are described by uh, convolution of this elastic kernel with the plastic field. And then, of course, I need to introduce also uh, some yield criterion. So the yield criterion tells me um, this, this, uh, this field N, this we call activity field, it can be either 0 or 1, tells me whether locally I'm active or not. So I need to write down some uh, dynamics for this uh, activity. And typically what we write down um, is uh, that we have that the local when the local stress exceeds the threshold, then it will yield. So zero uh, goes to one with some rule, some sto stochastic rule. And uh, we also have relaxation to the elastic state again, so it goes from one to zero with another stochastic rule. I don't specify these rules here because they can be different, and I will go into this discussion when I talk about the athermal uh, idea of um, modeling the systems. Okay. This was introduced first by Guimet Picard. Okay. Go further. So, when you go to very low shear rates, you see that uh, in these models you can reproduce displacement fields which look not so different from what you can observe in simulations, for example. So you can have here uh, the, the uh, correlations between events that lead to large uh, slip uh, events, for example. Whereas in, at large shear rate, you will see something which is very homogeneous on average. Okay. This is now a picture of the cumulated, uh, cumulated activity. You can imagine this when you deform a ruler, then you can see <coughs> where the cracks appear. So this is the equivalent to that. And you see that this is very heterogeneous. And uh, we believe that there is a dynamical phase transition when the shear rate goes to zero. Similar as in the depending scenario, if you don't control gamma dot, but you <coughs> control the stress, you are right at the yield stress here. Um, this is apparently similar to the glass transition. Why do I compare it to that? Because I will use some tools that, which are borrowed from this community. And uh, the difference is that here um, the length scales can really reach a macroscopic size. One example is here, this uh, experimental paper, but I know that you all have seen this in your simulations or experiments. So um, the tool that I borrowed to describe uh, correlated events in the finite shear rate um, regime uh, is a four-point correlation. So the problem, Mark Robbins already pointed that out, when you have at finite shear rates, um, avalanches are not uh, well defined anymore. So you have events that are occurring everywhere in the system with a given correlation length, and um, avalanches between each other also can be correlated. So this is a tool to capture um, the probability of having an activation somewhere given that at some earlier point, some elsewhere in the system, there was an activation before. So then you don't care whether they are connected or not and you can, for example, uh, look at uh, this G4 at the most correlated time so this is the volume that you get, the correlated volume and the stress fluctuations. And you can also integrate over this object and look at this as a function of time and you will get that um, for decreasing shear rate, you get longer and longer time scales for the cor correlations. And the peak, the height of the peak is an indication for a length scale and you will get also longer and longer length scales. So this is a signature for a critical point. I won't, we did some finite size 
uh, scaling analysis on this, but I don't want to talk here so much about um, quantitative results, but more qualitative results. <coughs> so I will rather go now to the other question, which is um, what is the control parameter to go one from one to the other, right? From the homogeneous flow with the continuous transi transition that I just showed you to a system where you have shear bands in the steady state. And uh, in the very same model, if you define your yielding, so this is now the local stress as a function of time, you hit a local yield uh, stress here, and um, you will yield uh, with a certain time. So there's a duration of a localized flow event. And uh, within this framework, we find if this <coughs> Uh, time is very long, you find that within the mean field description of this model, you get a minimum in the flow curve. So this indicates that there is an instability because by increasing the shear rate, you get, get a decrease of the stress. This must be unstable. And so you, uh, you, assume you will expect that there is localized flow. And indeed, when you do the simulations, you find that at small shear rate you and large restructuring time, this means large uh, healing time locally, you will have shear bands. And you can study this shear bands as, uh, as a function of the shear rate. And you see that if you go to larger and larger shear rate, um, it occupies more and more uh, uh, parts of the system. So at a critical shear rate, you will reach the system size. This is where the system flow becomes homogeneous again. Okay, this seems to be quite consistent. Um, we were not the first to think about this in these terms. Uh, there was a paper by Cousseau and Ovalets who was pushing also forward the idea of having a time which is responsible to obtain a non-monotonic flow curve for the minimum. And uh, so we are exactly in line with this thinking. But I should say that there could also be other origins, which is, for example, flow concentration coupling, shear weakening. Also, in the soft glass rheology, you can have uh, a coupling of the effective temperature, which I don't go into. But there are different ways how you can get this uh, shear band phenomenon. And I just want to say that we believe that the shear weakening, this is local shear weakening, um, is similar to our idea. That means that you have locally broken something and next time it will be easier to break it again. So this is also um, uh, in the same spirit that you think there's a long healing time that leads to shear band formation. Going to the next. Now I will come to the main part of the talk which is um, the question of thermal dynamics. And this is a little bit dangerous, and so be nice. <laughs> so um, what we propose for the thermal dynamics and the yielding um, <coughs> dynamics is that uh, you will have a duration of a plastic event. So there, to, to model this, uh, there should be only two ingredients. There should be uh, the fact that your system is structurally disordered, so you have a distribution of yield stresses, and you have a certain duration of a plastic event, so a certain dissipative time. And the interplay between the drive and this duration of the event will then lead to your nonlinear flow curve. So um, these are simulations done by Alexandre Nicolas, and uh, he finds a flow curve with an exponent of 0.56, which has been found a lot in the literature, 0.5 in experiments and in uh, theory, but I'm not sure, I talked to Mark Robbins, he's telling me this is only a size, uh, if uh, finite size effect, so I wouldn't put my hand into the fire for this exponent. So this, by the way, would be the beta exponent in Mathieu's um, talk, one over, uh, so this is one over beta, right? So then the question is now, if we want to derive 
mean field descriptions, um, the question that I want to ask is, are, are thermal dynamics effectively thermal? And uh, it's very... Um, it's very tentative to think, well, you have uh, uh, an energy landscape, and then what happens if you have your events here and there, and they have a long range inter interaction, you have fluctuations that occur, mechanical noise. You could think all these fluctuations um, are the same. Temperature and mechanical fluctuations are all equivalent. So then you would think mechanical noise fluctuation should um, help you also to overcome barriers, and you would write an erroneous law with an effective temperature here. We don't believe in this picture. Why? First of all, um, one argument that uh, you can give is when you, when you have a rearrangement somewhere, that means that elsewhere, um, there is a persistent change of the boundary conditions. It's not like a random kick that is done in a temperature situation, right? So mechanical noise fluctuations are persistent. And then uh, it, within the model that I just showed you, which is the mesoscopic model, you can calculate um, the escape time as a function of the yield energy. And you find that it's power law instead of exponential which means that it's much easier to escape. So, which means that the analogy would be flawed. Another picture that you can, you know, ma more mathematically, you can uh, motivate it like this. So you have uh, your state uh, within the potential energy la uh, landscape picture, and you will have fluctuations the potential due to the real temperature, ambient temperature. And you can ask the question, what does the mechanical noise do? So if you shear the system, your potential will be tilted. And you can write down the dynamics for the strain, which is given here. It's an overdent <coughs> dynamics. Uh, here's the derivative of the tilted potential. And you have the thermal noise. Um, now, how do you get to the plastic mechanical noise, well, you can write down uh, the corresponding equation for the strain, which will be uh, governed by uh, the increase to the shear rate and the fluctuation in the strain. What this means, um, instead of having additional fluctuation within the energy ball, you have fluctuation in the tilting of the potential, which is very different uh, with respect to thermal fluctuations, right? Okay, um, so this is why we believe um, if you want to write down a mean field model, it's another question where, whether this, is sense, uh, this makes sense at all or not, but if you want to write down a mean field model, this mean field model should take into account this, um, uh, this feature that uh, temperature fluctuations are different from mechanical fluctu fluctuations. So, and uh, there is a model it's called uh, the epole model. It has been a little bit uh, forgotten. Not many people study this equation. And uh, so what it describes is the exact same scenario that I showed you before, is that you look at the probability distribution of stresses, which uh, has, has changed due to uh, the shear rate here. So this is the gradient term. Then this term describes you some rate to break when you're above sigma c. This is your local yield criterion. <coughs> and then uh, this is the rate with which you go here to zero. This could be another value as well. And the uh, effect of the elastic propagator goes into this term, which is a noise term, right? It's a diffusion term on the stress. And uh, so here, um, when you look at this picture, and I will just show as well the rate. So the rate here is the typical time over which you yield when you're above sigma c. And uh, so the picture here would be that you have a random walk on the flat energy surface instead of having a random walk on the potential. Okay. 
and uh, so this this uh, equation like this is quite boring and it doesn't give uh, any uh, interesting physics. The interesting physics comes in when you say that this diffusion coefficient should be coupled to the activity. This is where this equation becomes nonlinear in P and difficult to solve as well, more difficult to solve at least. But uh, this is where you get um, the feature that depending on this coupling strength, you can have either a Newtonian regime or when the coupling strength is small, you have a yield stress and you have this harsh Barclay form. And you can analytically solve this uh, model and you get an exponent which is one half. So maybe you think you haven't seen this uh, in the conference yet, but actually you did. You saw a spatial version of this, which is the CAP model derived by Bouquet et al, Lederic Bouquet. And uh, this was used uh, to fit all the data in the talk of Ken Cameron. So if you were convinced by what Ken was showing you, you should also be convinced by these equations for the simple shear. Okay. So there are many assumptions in the, in the Evole Q model. One being very strong, that is the color of the noise, the mechanical noise, being white noise. We didn't believe this at first, and then we did microscopic simulation of uh, Leonard Jones systems here, and actually we see that if you look at the stress diffusion, um, here's the mean square, dis mean square displacement of the stress diffusion, uh, you see that uh, it's linear in T, so it seems to be, at least in the system, a good approximation. Then another thing, so I didn't insist on that too much, but if you look in the equation, we put here in the equation a single uh, yield stress. So this is all the same for all uh, the sites. And uh, of course, you would expect that due to this order, this should be a distributed value. And indeed, when you do simulations and you measure the yield stress, I can explain more how we do this, um, you find that there's a distribution of these yield stresses. So one question, one important question is whether um, the exponent that you get from the Epro le queue is robust with, uh, with respect to this distribution. And uh, it's an important question because in the FGR model, for example, it's the very form of this distribution that gives you the herschel barclay law. So Elisabeth Agorizas uh, is doing this calculation and she um, uh, studies the robustness of this exponent with respect to the yield stress distribution. And it turns out that the equations are still analytically solvable. And for reasonable distribution that are not power law, but rather exponential decay, etc., cetera, um, we get a change of the herschel barclay law but only in the coefficient and the yield stress, whereas the, the exponent is robust. If you want to know more about this, there's a poster as well. So I come to the conclusions. <laughs> um, so uh, I wanted to insist that um, this mesoscopic modeling, even though it might be, seem unrealistic, um, is a very useful tool to think about and test physical concepts. Um, and I showed you some examples on dynamical heterogeneities and phase separation. And uh, you can even use them to fit experiments. I didn't show this here, but you can um, push it further and get real comparison to experiments. Um, also, they give a tool, since they are simple enough, they give a tool to arrive to derive analytical solvable mean field equations. And, uh, but I also want to insist that afterwards you need to test the assumptions and results on experiments and on simulations because there's no, um, no solid derivation of this equation. So you, you really no need to go back and see whether your toy model works uh, in the right way. Okay, another word I wanted to say about equilibrium concepts. So I think one should be very careful when you generalize non-equilibrium, uh, when you 
uh, generalized equilibrium concepts to non-equilibrium systems. For example, in this case, uh, I showed you that we believe that our thermal yielding is very different from the in nature from the thermal yielding. <coughs> Sorry. The outlook, um, so what we want to study in future is to see what are the relevant features in the microscopic simulations. For example, um, we saw that the yield stress distribution doesn't seem so important, but there will be other features that are. And um, to see how we can relate parameters in the phenomenological models to microscopic dynamics. For example, this restructuring time, do we know what potential we need to put into microscopic simulations to get a large restructure in time mm -hmm. that gives you shear bending? And then also um, the question more on a mean field level, how can we push further the modeling to go to the uh, thermal material in a low temperature regime, for example, where you will have competition between thermal and mechanical noise. And the first attempt uh, to generalize the equations is given on the post over Isaac here. Okay. Just uh, last thing, I have a little announcement. I don't have three positions, but one uh, available in two, 2015. This is on failure precursors in soft matter, and it's uh, in collaboration with our experimental partner in Montpellier. Thank you very much. equations to the soft glassy rheology just yes because mm -hmm. I've not looked at this for a while of course so um, if you wanted to write down a model that um, reproduces the soft glassy rheology mm -hmm. you would need to have also a re repulse um, uh, how, do, how do you say a recoil force so you need a diffusion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Within a potential, so there should be an Correct. additional yes. term okay. that mimics the potential. That's it. Um, and then the form of the sigma minus sigma c, whether if the sigma c yes, is distributed exactly. If you, or not. Exactly. If you want to write down you know, SGR uh, the traditional way, you won't put the diffusion plus the potential, but you directly write down the coarse grain thing with the Arrhenius mm -hmm, mm -hmm. term, but, right? But these two should effectively give me, yes. give me that. And so then is the SGR temperature like the fluctuations of the, str of the stress in like? Here? No. So you said the stress fluctuations look white noise like? Yes. But, that but this is not sufficient because um, it depends. So this is the picture. <coughs> that I show you here. You have white noise, mm -hmm. but it, um, what we believe, it's fluctuations on the tilting of the potential. It's not adding uh, to the noise that is within the potential in our thermal situations as well, uh, I would say. Okay. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it's Matthias here. I want to better understand how you corroborate with your molecular dynamics that you're doing something sensible. Maybe you can show that. I didn't understand what you actually measure. So you shear the system you at what shear diffusion? rate? Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, this is um, a sheared system. And uh, what you measure, okay. Uh, we, we wanted to depict exactly the same thing like the EPRO LECU or the mesoscopic model does. That is, we, we um, divide boxes. We measure already the typical size of the events. Then we divide boxes in our system that have the same size as the size of events. And within the size, we measure um, stress fluctuations, right? So you have a solid, and you shear it at what rate? Is that oh, you shear uh, the hell out of it, or is it close to any transition? It is, so it's highly jammed. And uh, it's sheared slowly. At the very so you would be period. close to a transition. Yeah, close to the transition. Yeah. This is already where you should see avalanches and all these things. 
I could look up the exact share rate. I don't know it here. But. Can I imagine a measurement for that? A what? Can I measure that function? Measure that function? Can I devise an experiment to ah. measure that? So I know that there are emulsion experiments <coughs> by Weeks et al. And they uh, can measure the stresses. Okay. So they have a way from the from the geometrical form of, of their emulsion bubbles to get the stresses. So they should be able to, but this is tedious, of course, but they could measure this. Yeah. And you say if the Yeah. <laughs> and you argue if, if that turns out to be linear, like diffusive, then you're in business. Oh, no, you could, so you could generalize. So I'm just saying you need to test, right? We put something, so no, not we, but Ebrolecu, they put this term without knowing. So we even thought mm, probably this is wrong. Um, then you go and measure, and you <coughs> could very well here have, instead of white noise, another colored noise, right? This is just to say, um, once you write down the equation, you get the exponent, you, you think, well, maybe this is describing something. You go back to the, to the initial assumptions, and you verify and maybe th there are other assumptions within this. For example, a very important one, which is wrong and which should change things, is that here in the Ebrolecu model, you are releasing the stress to a stress value of zero. This is not true. And this is something that changes your flow curve. I don't know about the exponent, because it's difficult to calculate things in this limit. but. Um, I'm over here. Yeah. Really beautiful talk. Um, I had a comment and then a question. Uh, and so the comment that I would make is, is that um, you said that you know areas that have already broken are easier to break, and that's the basic physical origin of the shear banding that you see in your model. And you commented, which I think is I agree with, that actually that shows up in Karin's model with damage. Mm -hmm. But actually, that's exactly the same feature that shows up in Suzanne Fielding's recent paper exactly. in SGR and the mm -hmm. fluidity models. And actually all the STZ models exactly. as well. Um, and so then the comment would simply be that I think that the way to distinguish between models, besides your very well taken point that you should try to measure things in mm -hmm. actual experiments and simulations, is to also look at um, the shape of the shear bands, how they change as a function of quench rate and not just strain rate. Lots of, you know, in other words, what it means is, is I think we're converging to an idea, but then you have to test it very carefully. Um, so that's the comment. And yes. then, and then the question is, is as um, I was really sort of struck by the fact that, you know, you showed that the mechanical fluctuations are persistent in the way. And so mm -hmm. uh, it, this is probably a dumb question, Mecha but... Persistent. They, they are diffusive. Uh, you had on a slide that you sort of said that the mechanical fluctuations are mm -hmm. persistent. Ah, persist ah, I see what you mean. So once you do something there, all the changes are permanent, right? Yeah, you said they're sort of irreversible, yes, right? Yes, that's um, what everybody says, right? I, I totally agree. And I was just wondering, uh, well, I may have misunderstood, but I also, given that the fact that the, the sort of fluctuations that you see from uh, stress fluctuations are so different from the ones that you see thermally, I was wondering if you could map it on to some of these models for active particles that have a persistence time to their motion and uh, are... So it's not persistent in sense of persistent time, of course, yeah. Well, so you'll see, yeah, you the will noise see, structure you, you is will different. say during, during the event, since everything is instantaneous, you're right, there's persistent. And this is something we do with Ezekiel Ferrero. You can see when you study this without shear, you see during this time that there are compressed exponentials in the stru structural relaxation. Um, so it is important and there is some persistence. But um, I, I don't think that's the same thing like an active matter. Well, I it's agree. It, it can't be the same yeah. thing exactly. <laughs> it's but inert, I, right? It's not. Well, but I was just wondering if there might be an interesting analogy to be made that the noise structure, you know, is it a feature of the noise structure being different? And could you map that onto a different set of problems that people can study very easily? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, in your um, calculation, can you actually predict the stress strain curve, see the fluctuation in the curve? Whether we get the, uh, so. Yes. 
when we do the mesoscopic model, of course, we get we get all the phenomenologic phenomenology that we saw before with the avalanche dynamics. So you can see the elastic uh, charging, avalanches, so you get fluctuations with low shear rates. Yes, you do in the, in the steady state, for example. Uh, in the mean field, of course, you don't because you're only interested in, in the mean values. And you can do it at different uh, strain rate? You can, in the mesoscopic model, uh, yeah, this is all at different strain rates. This is uh, all, all the, the point of this talk is really to see how the stress is changing the shear rate or strain rate. Thank you. Two more questions. Yes. One over there. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering about the following. You are able to investigate one shear band, but in, but in experiments very often you have a pattern of shear bands. Mm -hmm. And pattern of shear bands involve a different scaling, specifically spaces between Bands. Uh, You're working in. Second. You're working in metallic glasses. Or in For example, we we observe pattern of shear band in granular materials. Granular materials. We observe pattern of shear band in amorphous materials. Mm -hmm. And the interesting a new uh, let's say phenomena is a scaling mm -hmm. which determines yeah. the, the space between shear bands. So I, I'm not sure. So okay, in granular material, I'm not a specialist in granular material. I will material, show you. But okay. um. There is a difference between, so there is a confusion uh, of what people call shear bands, right? So what I showed before, where you have at very low shear rates um, dynamical heterogeneities, you can have also correlated events that go through all the system size, which you could call also a shear band. And I think in all the, um, so what I believe is when you have a very hard system, um, this prepares uh, a fracture. So this is what, what you would see. And there you see all these fractures. So this was what I showed, the, the dynamical structure factor or the G4 calculation were done for this. And there you see a fractal of this. Whereas if you go to the um, long steady state limit, I'm more thinking of foams and, and things like this that you can shear during a long time, um, at least in the foam systems or emulsion systems, typically you see just one shear band that goes through the hole. Initially, you see different things, of course, but in granular, I, I'm not sure how this looks like. OK, Charles, make it quick. OK. Um, so um, if I'm not mistaken, you had a slide in the beginning that showed that um, shear, no, no, that rate weakening is necessary for shear banding, if I'm correct. Not necessary. One yeah, possible. Yeah, yeah, this is something that I respectfully disagree with because. Yeah. I just say it's 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 one of the phenomena. It's not necessary. Yeah. Uh, uh, what I think I is that shear band. If you have this, that you get shear bands. Yeah. What? She showed you one mechanism where you can get it without mechanism. Right? Yeah. So yeah. Why but but still, still, this is something I'm a little bit dubious about because I think shear banding is supposed to. To, to be associated with some kind of spatial heterogeneity and not with some global structure, and rate weakening is more or less global. What kind of shear, shear bands are you talking about again? Uh, because I also showed you the dynamical heterogeneities. We do have them. But then you can go to another regime where, for example, in foams, you just have one band that is flowing during a long, long, long time, and it's not changing position because it's fixed to the wall. And I think then you are closer to this description. So, so, so you're referring to what you what you call dynamical heterogeneities? Instead. Yeah, the shear bands, no. These shear bands are permanent shear bands, and they are not dynamical heterogeneities. So if you see the picture here, if you do the simulations, um, sorry, where do I have this? This. Mm -hmm. When you go to the infinite system size limit, um, this shear band will be just stuck there. It's, right. it's uh, spontaneously appeared. It's stuck us there, and it stays there forever. Right, and it is actually this kind of shear band which, in my mind, has no close to nothing to do with rate weakening behavior. It, no I think, question. it has to do with some spatial heterogeneity of how you prepare the material instead of the global part. You're working part in hard amorphous systems, don't you? Okay. Okay. I, I think in hard amorphous system it's very different than from soft 
soft material. Let's continue this discussion okay. at lunch. We are going to now prepare for Vincenzo Vitelli's talk. Let's thank Kirsten.